Welcome everyone to our webinar. Today we'll be talking to Lars Olson and Mark Higgison. Lars is the Midwest Director of Wired Score and Mark is with Encompass AV. The topic of conversation today is going to be around Wired Score and how it applies to the construction industry and to buildings in general. The costs related to a build out that became technologically obsolete are enormous. With significant disruption risks associated with all moves, ads and changes needed in today's building IT and cabling systems. The resources, expertise, design decisions needed early on are crucial to ensuring your development and redevelopment is always ahead of the IT curve. Um, today we'll be talking to Lars, like I mentioned. Now let Lars uh, take it from here and introduce himself. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, as you said, um, um, I'm with Wired Score and, and heads up our um, Midwest um, division. And, and really, in a nutshell, what Wired Score is, is uh, we provide a certification for buildings based on their connectivity and, and uh, in-building technology. So if you're familiar with other industry certification levels like LEED or WELL, it, it works in a similar fashion that we will give a building or a development a score based off various criteria that has to do with connectivity and in-building technology, and then you can obtain a platinum, silver, gold um, level of certification that's helpful in both marketing, uh, but also there's a lot more to it where we uh, can provide a lot of valuable insight when it comes to the planning and design of buildings to make sure that you're not building a building that um, becomes obsolete, as Anatoly was um, alluding to, uh, because technology is changing fast. Thank you, Lars. Mark? My name is uh, Mark Higgison. I am a registered communication distribution designer. Uh, I've been with Encompass since 1999, and uh, I'm really happy that you guys are uh, speaking with us today. This is a, a very interesting subject. Uh, we discovered Wired Score in 2017 and just thought it was a fantastic idea. Uh, it, it was a way for uh, a common language to be spoken between real estate uh, managers, uh, the telecom industry, and, uh, and, and tenants, because uh, there, there's a lot of tech going on in today's modern office. And uh, a lot of times people just didn't really understand what they were getting into. Uh, and, and that led to a lot of difficulties. I, I completely agree. And you know, on that point, Lars, so we, we've all heard of smart buildings as they apply to residential, to a degree commercial. It's a term, but nobody really understands what it is at the end of the day. And there's no standardized process of what defines a smart building. Is it something that's got a, a smart connected thermostat or is there more to it? So I wanted to see if you could, you know, you touched on what Wired Score is, but I wanted to see if you could kind of give a little bit more background on what goes into it and what are the certification levels? Right, absolutely. Um, so the, uh, what we do right now is that we're offering certifications primarily for uh, office buildings and those are um, wired certified and uh, silver, gold, platinum based on um, the different criteria that includes everything from diverse points of entry and telecom room, uh, planning, security, risers and all these things. When it comes to smart buildings, we don't yet offer a certification for smart buildings because as you just said, um, it is it is really hard to know uh, what makes a building smart. And we see a lot of building owners and designers, they're proclaiming that they have a smart building, um, but no one really knows what that actually entails. So we've actually recently announced that uh, we've put together a, a smart building council where we've gathered all the um, uh, gathered executives from all the uh, biggest uh, real estate developers and owners and, and industry experts to sit on a global panel where together we're going to figure out what exactly are the criteria that should be in place for a building to be called smart. So yeah, stay tuned. There will certainly be a, a smart building certification coming soon. And Mark, you know, you've been at the forefront that for, 20 years of this. How have you seen this evolve? How have you seen the evolution of what goes into a building and what developers are looking for? And more importantly, what the end users and tenants are looking for kind of evolve over time? Well, I, I think just internet connectivity and its importance has, has really changed the most uh, over, over my career span to the point 
now where it is simply the most important function of an office. If an office loses internet connectivity, uh, the day's done. It's the same as losing power, essentially. What work can be done without network connectivity at this point? Um, now, there was never really a focus uh, for any of these. these all of these uh, systems, uh, networking, any, any kind of smart building systems that were uh, uh, there previously, any kind of sur uh, surveillance systems or access control, these were all separate systems. They didn't speak to each other. They were on their own cabling networks. They were in installed by separate contractors. That's really beginning to change now. So instead of having 10 to 15 different networks in a building, uh, we're trying to move more towards a converged network that we can have all of these services live on. It's easier to manage, it's easier to plan for, uh, and, and it's easier to upgrade into the future. So we're really seeing a more unified communication system as opposed to many, many separate systems as uh, you know we did originally when I got involved with that. But over here at our office, we're, we're doing our best to define what a smart building is. Um, and anyone in the Chicagoland area, we'd like to invite out here to show some of these advanced systems that we have and, and they can help uh, define what a smart building is, uh, you know, for themselves. Actually, I, I can, I have a really <laughs> personal experience with, with that, with multiple networks. Um, and um, that was the, in my, in my past role as director of innovation for a real estate investment firm. One of my uh, uh, responsibilities was to identify technologies uh, that we could use to add value to assets or, uh, you know, improve operational effectiveness. When, when we were redeveloping them. And so I thought, okay, great. I'm going to have a managed network for the ISP to tenant, and that's going to be great. They're going to own that relationship. And then we'll have a network, a managed network that's going to take care of all the automation for the building and for the, you know, for on a tenant level. And uh, managing two networks like that became, was, was expensive <laughs> it turned out to be and, and, and very complicated and and ultimately a lot of buildings that i was looking at just didn't have the foundational digital infrastructure to layer all these new technologies on top of so if you're talking about access controls or security or uh, building management systems or all of these things like if you're going to if you for for a building to be able to adapt and use technology like that it is absolutely critical that the foundational infrastructure digital infrastructure is there and and that you know is, is fiber and uh, and uh, conduits and, and all of these things that are expensive to put in after the cement is poured so planning is very important absolutely and I've read and, uh, sorry go ahead mark sorry um I, this would uh, be a wired score issue too, because if, if you had a legacy building with multiple networks in it, it, it very well uh, could stop you from installing new technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, this cable must be removed. A lot of times it's still in these buildings and it's clogging your risers and really uh, putting a stop on the potential of, of what an office space could be. Yeah, we have seen uh... When we do building audits and walk buildings and inspect the rock risers, conduits, and, and all of these things, it's uh, it's incredible the things that you you see. Um, as you said, the risers can can get clogged because when a tenant move out, sometimes they just cut the fiber, leave it in the risers, it gets full. First of all, it's a fire hazard, and then you have to pull new wiring and cables elsewhere, which is not up to building code and uh, isn't uh, very secure if you have exposed fiber that anyone can tap into, so to speak, so. Oh yeah, we haven't even began to touch the physical uh, security of your network. Right, right. Um, Cyber security is, uh, is also very much a physical thing as, as we see and we've seen often telecom equipment mounted on plywood in a parking garage for anyone to walk up to or a car to back into. And these are buildings that have tenants that could be everything from hedge funds to the Department of Defense. It's, uh, and, it's and it's all exposed. So it is, it is worrisome. 
Yeah, and, and hacking is a very interesting subject because most people just imagine someone behind a laptop somewhere for some reason with a, a hoodie on. Uh, but it, it's much more than that. It's, it's people uh, on the telephone claiming access issues. It, it is, it's physical issues, people uh, putting physical devices on the network. Um, it, it's a multi-pronged world and, and there's actually a lot to know and fear about it. And unfortunately, um, it's, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. So we have to prepare for it. And in preparing for it, you know, what can developers, what should developers be doing right now to deliver against their tenants' increasingly complex internet and mobile connectivity needs and security needs? Well, what should they be on the lookout for and making sure they're doing right now? Yeah, we're, we really try to, to be there as someone that can look at the plans and, and draw from the experience that we have from working with um, developers across the, across the globe and across the country, across the region, and, and, and uh, you know, share best practices that we've seen um, because there could be it, a lot of uh, developers, they, they like to keep uh, their cards pretty close to their chest, especially if they're being innovative, they want to be first, there's always this amenities race and things like that. But I think we're all better off and the tenants are better off and the industry in general if, if we share best practices and, and expertise. So we try to yeah, tap into that um, the, those things that we see every day and, and try and help um, other developers avoid expensive pitfalls where, I mean, we've, I could talk examples all day, but we've seen developers that thought they were building what was going to be a platinum certified building. And then we look at the plans and we see that, oh, they only have a single point of entry uh, for ISPs, for instance, but they have everything else. They have the risers, they have two telecom room that are locked off and secure. Um, so it's just important that someone, a third party um, looks at it and, and just gives uh, you know an, another set of eyes to make sure nothing was overlooked. And early on too. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I typically say that, um, you know, if, if you, want to work with us towards end of schematic design process is really the ideal time to 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 get involved because you know you, you're still doing bids and you haven't finalized any any construction drawings or anything like that so uh, that's the cheapest time to to, uh, to make changes if you need to yeah we we like uh, catching mistakes on paper it's it's much easier all around exactly and what, uh, Mark, what are you seeing right now? You know, we have new buildings and we have existing buildings. Existing buildings you mentioned are the ones with a lot of the problems, a lot of the, the cut cables and so forth. What have you seen building owners doing and Lars, you too, especially as it relates to your past experience of director of innovation to improve these buildings, to change them. Are you seeing this primarily applied to, as far as wired score to new construction or are you seeing retrofits right now also being cognizant of the changes and preparing for the future? Yeah, we, we, we do see both both fields uh, really kind of getting a mindset now of, of what needs to be right. Without standards, we're in the Wild West. And that's really where, you know, our, our eyes perked up when we first started hearing about uh, wired score. Um, I've done an awful lot of study on telecommunications, you know, uh, how large, uh, you know, risers need to be, all, all the odds and ends, uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a built standard. So, um, right, and it's something that's ever evolving, right? We, we constantly, as I'm sure other um, certifications have to too, to keep maintain their integrity. You know, you constantly have to to update the criteria as, as technology um, changes and, and demand is changing. And a good example of that is that our scorecard didn't in the past typically uh, give points for fixed wireless, but fixed wireless has become uh, in most markets, really robust and a really uh, efficient solution for to provide redundancy. Um, so, so now you actually do get points for that um, because you can have as much as, you know, you can get gig speed internet on uh, stable uh, on fixed wireless. So 
that's an example of you know technology evolving and 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 you know the likes of us adapting to it. And uh, we're doing our best to throw more at you too. Um, <laughs> one of the most exciting things that we have back here uh, in our warehouse, uh, one of the network technologies that we like to showcase is PoE lighting. So. POE not as in point of entry, uh, like everyone at Wired Score uh, would think, but powered over the ethernet. So we're actually using network cabling and power from the switches to power the lighting that's above me right now. Uh, I have three separate systems here, but this is all gonna live on the building's network also. So we're looking at significantly more cabling per floor. Wow. Uh, security cameras used to be on their own proprietary cable on a uh, radio grade cable, also part of the network now. Uh, many of my audio systems are networked audio systems where previously they ran on analog cables in an analog world and now they're on the network also. So I would imagine much, much more is coming out. And uh, actually one of my favorite boring technologies here is our PoE clock. It's an analog dial clock, but it's actually powered and timed from the network. So boring everyday tech, but it's actually really interesting to me. You know, to, to expand on that, so the data cables that used to connect pretty much to, to the computer. You want internet on, the, on a workstation, that's where you need a data cable. Everything else was separate. Right now, with wired score, with the new technologies, beyond PoE lights, what other kind of what other kind of systems and technologies are you seeing running on these converged networks? Well, really anything. Um, if you look at most electronics, uh, they run on DC power and uh, AC power is used to distribute it. It's by far the most efficient means of distributing power, but the devices themselves use DC power. Uh, PoE is DC power. So as long as it's not, let's say a giant coffee machine or a washer dryer, uh, we probably have sufficient power to, to power most anything. Um, I have a PoE powered uh, uh, computer. It's it's a desktop Windows 10 all-in-one monitor, and it's powered simply by one Cat6 line. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, that would be uh, that's going to be a game changer for yeah access controls and um, you know, especially when you remodel or or redo um, buildings where you don't want to necessarily rip up um, walls and uh, tear down everything you can maybe get away then with you know the existing infrastructure that's in place there i'm given a certain amount of voltage now and and the government has uh met of our, our enthusiasm by slowly giving us more and more power to work with over a cat six cable so uh we're up to uh 100 watts uh right now currently i don't do anything more than 60 watts here but it's plenty of room even in my back room where i have uh what's what's called a high base ceiling it's about 15 feet up I have a PoE light that performs better than the standard lighting at significantly uh, less energy use. But this is lighting. You, you've got to come and see this. This isn't something you could just take my word for, uh, you know, over a video conference. So that's why we have them set up here. Uh, we love technology, but we've seen it sync people. So we use our space as a laboratory. We like to really vet our technologies here and make sure this is something you know we want to get into. Lighting in particular, we had to live under this for a while before it was something we were going to recommend for our customers. Um, we like to do that with every technology. I, I have some very interesting surveillance technologies here that uh, I would like to show people uh, in person, but these are all network technologies now. Um, I could tell you a quick example of uh, where low voltage technology really came out ahead of high voltage. Uh, we had a client that had a parking garage that was built in the 1980s. And uh, it would be really difficult to add power infrastructure to it, but they wanted to upgrade the surveillance system. Uh, ends up that the fiber line that we thought we could tap into was uh, a tenant's fiber line, so we couldn't touch it and the, uh, the actual conduit had been destroyed several years earlier. Uh, we had a single RG59, which is a, a, a coax TV cable that, that was surviving. So we were actually able to uh, use that to provide internet, but I was able to use low voltage technologies to power all of my cameras uh, using uh, step down voltage. So we started out with a very high voltage and then we, we stepped it down to make a difference. And we were able to wire up the entire parking garage, saving the client $25,000 in, in electrical work. That's really cool.
I just wanted to touch on something that Mark was saying about wiring and more wiring. And I think it's a general misconception that people think that we're moving towards, you know, 5G and, and everything wireless. And that ultimately means less wiring and less need for space in buildings for telecom equipment, cellular. But it, in reality, it actually ends up being more um, and without getting too into it. But 5G travels at a much higher frequency than 4G. And when everyone is going to expect their 5G phones um, to work at, at the office or in their homes, and they have all installed low energy glass that this high frequency won't be able to get through, no one's going to actually be able to utilize um, 5G um, unless you have uh, some internal system like a distributed antenna system in the building. Um, so, so ultimately, yeah, the faster internet becomes and the more devices that we connect to the network wirelessly, we actually need more wires on the, on the back end to, to, to run all of this. Yeah, it's true. The, it's, it's really only wireless for the end user. Uh, if you pop your head ab uh, above the ceilings, there, there is significantly more cable. And actually, you, you brought up really the best point, which is 5G and, and how it's going to affect people and how it's going to affect buildings. And a lot of these buildings already have uh, DAS or distributed antenna systems, uh, you know, for, for several reasons, but they're not going to be adequate for 5G. This is going to require a redesign, uh, you know, remapping of floors, uh, so we're going to have to do this all over again. You know, I'm glad you touched on wireless. I, I think the instant question with wireless is security. Um, what have you seen kind of what has been the conversation around the more wireless technology, the more wireless devices, the closer we get to 5G being kind of a mainstay. What are the security kind of risks and what, what is involved in a wired score in general to, to account for that? So when it comes to... For instance, one of the things that we look at and score on and give points on is common area Wi-Fi. Um, so, so if you provide Wi-Fi to your buildings, which really it's become something that tenants expect. And again, it just shows that tenants in both multifamily, commercial assets, they're the lines between hospitality and, and you know, multifamily and, and office um, has been, been blurred and tenants are expecting, you know, a wholesome experience from their host or their landlord. Um, so, so wireless is, of course, a very important part of that because they're going to expect that all their devices are going to work wirelessly. And, and something interesting to bring up. Um... Wireless isn't available to everyone. So if you'll notice in a hotel, you're still gonna have uh, ethernet jacks everywhere. Um, and there's a reason for that. And that's because Wi-Fi is just radio. So you're broadcasting and it may be encrypted, but you are broadcasting everything that you do out. So anyone really can access that. So government employees aren't allowed to do their work on Wi-Fi. So that's, that's just one of the reasons you're, you're always gonna see some sort of wired connection and uh, they still don't suffer the same issues. Uh, you know, <laughs> Wi-Fi will occasionally have a dropout. Right. Uh, that makes sense. And Lars, you know, to kind of go full circle back on, on where you started just uh, career-wise, that you were in innovation on the real estate development side before going to Wired Score. And I, I think, and I'm sure the reason that you, that the company had that role was to improve the marketability of the buildings, whether it's marketability to tenants or the general value of the buildings. What are you seeing right now as far as Wired Score playing into that marketability? Um, how is it being communicated? How is it being received and just generally? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, ultimately that's how, th that's why Wired Score was started and founded. Um, uh, initially it was driven by that the real estate industry was getting a lot of questions from, um, from the tenant base around connectivity and in-building technology that they weren't able, that the leasing brokers and the developers weren't really able to, to answer and they didn't really have a language for how to talk about these things. Um, so that's how our founder came up with Wired Score, the company and, and Wired Certification, the product as a way for 
all the different state stakeholders to have a common language around connectivity and in-building um, technology. Because um, we often see that a, 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 a leasing deal can be slowed down by the prospective tenant asking technical questions that, first of all, the leasing broker can answer and then the developer can answer. So they have to go back to their engineers. And by the time they get an answer, they might have moved on to a different building where they got those answers uh, right up front. And one way that we help answer those questions right away or help leasing teams answer those questions is that we provide a fact sheet that has all the technical attributes of the building highlighted in plain English and, and will answer nine, if not 10 out of 10 questions that uh, a CTO will have. And we see technical teams being more and more involved in um, the office selection process just because no business can operate without internet connection these days. All their critical building um, software is obviously running off the cloud. And I mean, I think uh, it was Satya Nadella, uh, the Microsoft CEO said on a recent earnings call that they had seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months after COVID happened. So all these companies that have held off migrating to the cloud were forced to uh, now. So again, stable uh, internet connection, good internet connection and, and redundancy measures is just getting more and more important. But you also need to be able to talk about it in a way that people understand, right? Yeah, you, you had three very distinct uh, groups here, you, you, your, uh, you know, your, your stakeholders in it, your, your tenants, um, the telecom industry that built this stuff, and then the IT department, which none of these paths really cross. So they really needed a common language because, uh, you know, usually the client would never have access to the telecom engineers that, that built this. So well done. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, you know, as we kind of wrap up, I wanted to open it up for a little Q&A. We have a couple of questions here that I wanted to, to ask. So the first one that came up is, Lars, you mentioned in the beginning of the call that there are multiple levels of a wired score. I think you mentioned, you know, silver, gold, platinum. Very high level, kind of what is the differentiation between them and what kind of buildings are you seeing lean towards the different certification levels? Yeah, uh, I'd say that if you think of a platinum building, it's the kind of building that is trying to attract um, the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazon, big e-commerce platforms, stuff like that. Um, and those, we see more and more of those types of tenants demanding, um, they won't even, it's a good way for them to filter down options when they look at buildings and say, okay, if it's platinum certified, they know that you know, all the basic needs that they have are taken care of. Uh, that said, a gold building is a really good building from a technology perspective. And, and we have gold buildings that have hedge funds, trading platforms, and, and they're more than robust enough. Same with silver, which is also a good, has a good technology infrastructure, but the main difference between gold and a silver, for instance, is that a silver building typically needs some type of further investment in, in, in the future to, to maintain um, uh, that level uh, and not become obsolete from a technology perspective. Got it, makes sense. Um, next question is, um, again, going back to COVID, that we've seen a, a lot of technology evolution over the last few months. And one of the evolutions that we've seen is that um, people are working from home and residential connectivity is just as important as uh, commercial. So just wanted to see where Wired Score is on looking broader and looking a little bit beyond commercial uh, into residential and other types of property. You also mentioned hospitality. Yeah, um, I got to be careful not promising too much here, uh, but we, we do have a wired uh, or a certification program called Wired uh, Certification Home in, in the UK and Ireland. That's been running for a little over a year now and, and we've gotten great, great feedback from it. And, and honestly, whenever we talk to developers that, and, and building owners here in the US um, that do own or develop uh, different types of assets, including multifamily, the first thing they ask is, <laughs> So can you certify our multifamily assets too? And, and, and yes, it's something that we're working on. It's just, 
it's not copy paste. We can't use the same criteria and have the same scorecard uh, between different countries because building codes are different. And it's not like a software where you can uh, build it and, and change it um, on, as you go. You got to get it right the first time. That's, uh, that, that's kind of funny. Um, all of the technologies that we talk about in the office now, the next question is usually, can I have them in my residence? <laughs> And uh, we're, we're not really even thinking uh, about that yet, but uh, the office and the home are going to look more similar uh, in, in the future, <laughs> no matter what. Absolutely. This is a question uh, about POE lighting. Um, if the network goes down, do the lights go out? That, that's a great question. Absolutely not. Um, that, that was an original thought and uh, the, the lighting will remain if there's a uh, internet outage absolutely uh it, it's a local network control there's typically a server uh so network outages wouldn't affect your lighting uh at all so how do you connect emergency lighting on uh, poe systems uh there, there's a couple different uh ways uh so, so some people would choose just to use uh standard uh you know ac power for the emergency uh, other, otherwise there's battery backups that are in line uh, with the emergency lighting so that if, if we do, uh, you know, lose the POE lighting that these, these batteries would, would be on. That's a, that's a huge concern with lighting because there is an awful lot of, uh, you know, safety aspect to it. And then a second question also on POE lighting, um, how does it help with lower overall energy consumption in a building? Well, it, it, that's really like a multi-pronged answer because it, it several different aspects, uh, the efficiency of the architecture of the switch itself, but most importantly, uh, the sensor network and the intelligence behind it. So not using uh, as much, uh, using the power that you need, producing the light that you need instead of just 100% at all times. Uh, one of the techniques for this is called daylight harvesting where we actually have sensors in the ceiling that are looking for just normal ambient light in the room and it adjusts the, uh, the output of the light to kind of match whatever your setting is. Now, it's very difficult to measure each one of these lights with DC power. So what we've done here to kind of prove energy savings is uh, we have a monitor on the panel. So we're, we can monitor overall power usage in real time well, I flick the light switches and, and we could actually see the, the needles jump around. I could plug a vacuum cleaner in the wall and then the, the needle jumps up. But uh, yeah, the point is it, it's the simplest seeing is believing uh, test that I could do for people. And, and once again, I really encourage people to come out and visit us in Elk Grove. And, and you know, one of the things that just from personal experience, what, what I see with POE lighting, besides, you know, on and off, there's also just usability. By it being connected to the network, it takes into account a lot of other things. It takes into account how many people are in the room, which parts of the building are being occupied, and it turns on lights, turns on and off lights in accordance with what's actually needed at the time. And I think that that could also lead to some uh, cost savings, supposed to just having it on across the board. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm really spoiled too. When I walk into the office now, I don't hit a light switch. The lights just kind of slowly ramp on in, in a the theatrical kind of presentation. Uh, at first, I was very concerned with the physical light switches. I didn't like some of the offerings out there, but in practice, they're not used. Um, and, and to kind of tack on to what you were saying before, uh, these are networked lights. So it's also the basis of a sensor network now. So I could tack any kind of sensor load I wanted to onto the lighting system. So I, I could, uh, we could take temperature, we could check for air quality. Um, like you said, oc uh, uh, occupational sensors. How do you size the telecom room when you utilize POE for all the systems considering the importance of real estate? Well, there's a couple, there's, there's two schools uh, of thought with POE. Um, you would normally think that this, this is in a, in a TR, a telecom room, but not necessarily. The switches involved, um, the uh, Cisco digital building switch series is a switch designed to live in the plenum. So if we looked at uh, a spot like a hotel, you could actually have one switch per room, if that made sense to you. So they could be distributed. They wouldn't have to necessarily be in a central uh, telecommunication room 
where you would be limited by distance and, and a few other things. So these are actually built, you know, fanless uh, and, and to survive a dusty condition up in the plenum. Lars, how, how about on your end? Like, what are you seeing as far as the size of the rooms right now? Are, are they bigger, smaller? Can technologies be utilized to kind of save that real estate? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, a lot of developers that we see, they want to value uh, engineer those rooms away because they can get a, a parking spot or an office or a bathroom or something out of, uh, out of that, that, um, that they can measure uh, a return on more easily in the form of rent. Uh, but it's, you're just going to you have you first of all you don't know what's coming down the line so so say, setting aside some space will always be beneficial and yeah as i would say as much as you can afford to to allocate to to technology or telecom equipment or in general yeah definitely <laughs> yeah absolutely best practices dictates that you should uh, expect a 20 percent growth and, and build for that anyway so maybe in the future that that'll nudge a few percentage points higher. Got it. And I have one more question. Sure. Uh, can the data from the sensors be shared with other systems in the building? So this is this is the most exciting uh, part of the future to me. Uh, I'm I'm currently using the chef analogy, where if you look at technologies as ingredients, they're great on their own, you know. But what a chef does is he takes these ingredients and he mixes them together and he produces a totally new result. So we have all these network systems producing data on a, on a shared network, but they're not necessarily communicating with each other just yet. But they are written uh, open source, so they absolutely can. So now we live in a world where my security cameras or, or my lighting can tell my security camera something. Uh, a security camera can link with access control. Uh, access control can link with the temperature, uh, with the HVAC system. Just knowing that there's no one here, why would it be on? So all of these technologies, we're at the very beginning of them being integrated in ways that we're, we can't even think about right now. All the more reason to have the right network and be connected um, to, to be able to, to have these systems talk to each other. Yeah, none of this is going to happen without without a proper network. Uh, if if we're having these kind of inter, interconnection problems, uh, you know, it, it's it's not going to run smooth. Which ultimately, if the technology doesn't run smooth, it's it's either going to get left to the wayside or replaced by something better. Mm -hmm. That's all for the audience questions. I have one final question for for Lars. Um, these last four or five months have, have seen a huge shakeup in general. Um, just wanted to see what, what is Wired Square doing to account for, for what we've learned over the last five months and kind of what are the, the forward looking plans beyond what is currently in place? Um, not necessarily looking into other building types, but even within the same building types, are there changes that have been made as a result of, of what we've learned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we first of all, uh, we talk to building owners uh, that have existing buildings uh, now that, uh, you know, the buildings are empty and they're all most of them are taking the opportunity to upgrade systems um, that are hard to upgrade when uh, when you have thousands, in some cases, thousands of employees there and tenants there um, every day. So now they're upgrading infrastructure, but also everything from elevators uh, and access control and ultimately the the most uh, forward thinking um, landlords and developers now are taking this opportunity and installing touchless everything uh, and putting in uh, sensors crowd control and, and 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 sensors that can measure how much a room is being utilized and 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 all of these things and and again as you put more sensors in and de iot devices uh, it's becoming of course then increasingly important with uh, a, a solid backbone that all of this technology can live on top of um, so so that's really what we see a lot of now is that technology has really become top priority for a lot of landlords and developers. And for the ones that aren't prioritizing it, I, I, I'm afraid that, um, yeah, that will have lasting impact on the value of their assets for sure. 
No, and, and to that point right now, you mentioned that the buildings right now are upgrading and most of the tenants are out of the office working from home. Mm -hmm. When they return, what should be kind of the, how should they look at separating between the buildings networks and the tenant networks? Yeah, good question. Uh, that may be a question that's um, that's better asked of, of some of our engineers and, and uh, people um, like Mark and uh, that are, you know, into the weeds on the we technology aspect. Yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of clients um, would not necessarily even trust the same telecommunications rooms to be shared. Um, they like these rooms locked off completely. So then you really get into the realm of physical security. So having sensors and surveillance in your telecommunications room, you know, the actual front panels, there's sensors available uh, to see if, you know, anyone's actually physically gone into something. So it, it really depends on your industry, uh, I imagine. But uh, we, we have come across clients where we're not even allowed to run cabling uh, near their telecommunication room. Okay. Got it. Typically not the case, though. Got it. Um, I think that's that's it for our questions. Um, I wanted to thank both of you for being present, for sharing your expertise, and I, I think this was uh, fantastic. Yes, thanks for, uh, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, this was a great conversation, and uh, I, I hope you, you both can come out here and in real life at some point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we just barely touched on uh you know some of the things that we can offer on so and what we'll do yeah. is um when we're done with this we're going to have the recorded version that's going to be up on the encompass av site as well as maybe shared through wired um in the description we're going to include some additional supporting information lars has mentioned that there's some certification specs and so forth that he'll be sharing um we have i think a demo video of poe lights we'll probably include in there so we'll have additional links in there to provide just a little bit more uh more background for everyone to, to see. So thank you everyone for who participated and who watched and who's gonna be watching the recorded version going forward.